blessed Sunday po sa lahat sa ating pong mga kapatiran from uh, Bayambang Pangasinan, uh, Kamiling Tarlac, at sa lahat po ng nanonood ngayon. Uh, magandang umaga po at blessed Sunday po to all. And uh, kamusta po kayo? The Lord is good. Amen. No? The Lord is good. Every day the Lord is good. So... Uh, before we read our scriptures for this morning, uh, let's pray muna po. Heavenly Father, we worship you, we adore you, we give you honor and we give you praise. We bless your holy name, O Lord. Lord, ina-entrust lamang po sa inyo ang lahat-lahat sa umagang ito, Panginoon. Nalangin, O Lord, ang inyong awa at grasya, Panginoon, O Jesus. Salamat, Panginoon, sa inyong kabutihan sa nakaraang linggo, Panginoon, na kami po inyong iningatan, Lord Jesus, at kayo, Panginoon, ang nagbigay sa amin, Lord, ng kapayapaan. Salamat, Panginoon, purihin po ang pangalan mo, O Diyos. At ito po ang aming hiling sa matamis at makapangyarihang pangalan ni Jesus. Amen, amen. So, let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4:16 to 18, New International Version. So, sa verse 16, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we are wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and moment momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is, is unseen is eternal. Amen. A fundamental lesson daw po ng believers is to learn that we need not despair. No? Yun daw yung pinaka, napakahalagang lesson. So ano ba yung ibig sabihin ng despair? Yung sa Tagalog, ito ay mawala ng pag-asa. But always be filled with hope. Yun daw po dapat yung ano, pagiging isang kristyano. No? So, ano ba yung ibig sabihin ng field? Mapuno. So, kung puno ka ng pag-asa, mawawala yung iyong ano, uh, um, yung pagkaka, yung maging despair, no? Kasi puno ka ng pag-asa. So, ang sabi pa, losing heart is similar to losing hope. So, sa verse uh, 16, Sinasabi ni Paul no, sa mga Christians na, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Tapos, ang sabi niya pa dun sa 17, For our light and momentary, mag daw yun, and momentary, no, troubles are achieving for us eternal glory. It's uh, no, eh, sanctification no, every day. No. The reasons Paul did not lose heart is because he knew certain truth. Ano ibig sabihin yun? Tiyak na katotohanan. Kilala niya ang Diyos. Kasi certain, tiyak, no? tiyak na katotohanan. And His wonderful work. Truths which are also true with us as believers. So kung ano man yung mga katotohanan na si Paul, no? alam niya about God, ay tayo rin, no? na tayo rin ay alam din natin yon kung ano yung mga katotohanan na yun. Because kilala natin si Jesus. Ito ay para sa mga Christians lang. Each of us can and should also matter these lessons of no despair. No one need to lose heart. Yes, each of us at specific points will be tested. So, lagi namang may trials, no? may mga uh, dumadaan sa ating buhay. May mga pagsubok na, pero itong pagsubok na to ay lalo tayong tumitibay sa Panginoon. Dahil yung pagsubok, no? meron laging kasagutan si Lord. Eh. Meron siyang laging... Um, ibibigay na sagot at siya yung mag susob ng pagsubok na yun, ng trials na yun, no? And um, tested and tried and perhaps even tempted to give up our hope to live. Diba? Minsan give up na tayo, no? Give, give up na tayo. Parang, uh, bakit sunod-sunod kayo yung mga trials na dumarating sa buhay natin? Sa verse 17, for our light, and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory yun yun yung sagot doon no sa so, mga pinagdadaanan na it's very light lang daw yun so lahat ng trials para ka doon sa sinasabi ni Paul it's very light lang no 
Kaya tayong mga Christians, no? Ba't kailangan? Pero bakit, no? Bakit si Paul? Because he knows certain about God, no? And tayo din, no? Tayo mas uh, lumalalim tayo sa Panginoon. Mas lalo na nakikita kung gaano kabuti ang Panginoon. Kung gaano siya kapangyarihan. At makikita mo lahat ng troubles, lahat ng trials na dumarating sa'yo ay maliit lang sa mata ng Panginoon. No? At lahat yon ang Diyos ang tutulong sa atin upang mapagtagumpayan no ang mga ang lahat ng yon at ano ano noon di ba eternal glory no ang sarap no ang sarap ng ano ng uh, itong maliliit na to ay konti lang sa mata very light no at momentary panandalian lang yon hindi siya magtatagal pero pagkatapos noon yung makilala mo ang Diyos no lumalalim ka sa kanya because that's sanctification at yun lang po, at tayo po ay tumayo lahat at tayo ay manalangin bago tayo umawit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are our greatest hope, Panginoon. Tunay, Lord, na wala pong imposible sa inyo, Panginoon. Ang bawat isa po sa amin, O Diyos, ay may pinagdadaanan. Because, Lord, nandito pa po kami sa mundo, Panginoon. But ang lahat ng ito ay temporary lamang, Panginoon, O Lord. What is seen is temporary, O Lord, but what is unseen is eternal. Thank you, Jesus, that we have you, Father God, that we have hope in you. Purihin ka, Panginoon, sa kataas-taasan, O Lord, sinasamba po ang pangalan mo. At ito po ang aming panalangin, O Lord, sa matamis at makapangyarihang pangalan ni Jesus. Amen. Tayo na po ay umawit sa Panginoon.
our hope, you are our life, O oh Jesus. We worship you, Father God, Lord. We worship your holy name on high, O oh Jesus. We exalt your holy name, Father God. The great I am, there is none like you. Thank you so much, Lord.
are our almighty God, O Lord, and you are worthy to be praised, Father God. Salamat, Panginoon. Purihin po ang pangalan mo, O Diyos, sa kataas-taasan. Dinadakila po kayo, Panginoon. with you.
Thank you so much, Panginoon. Yes, O Lord, we believe in you, O God. We believe in your power, O Lord. We believe in your unfailing love, Lord Jesus. We believe in your, Lord Jesus, your your greatness, Panginoon, O Lord. You are the God of yesterday, today, and forevermore. Wala po kayong katulad, Panginoon, O Lord. Wala po, kayong, wala po kaming maipagmamalaki sa inyong harapan, Panginoon. Salamat, Panginoon, O Diyos, O Lord, for saving us, pa, Panginoon. Salamat, Panginoon, sa inyong kabutihan. At patuloy lamang po kaming nagtitiwala sa inyong kapangyarihan, O Lord. But to you, O Lord, nothing is impossible because you are the God who is able. Thank you so much, Panginoon, O Lord, sa mga pangako niyo sa amin, O Lord. Pangako, Lord God, na hindi po ito nagbabago noon, ngayon, at magpakailanman, Panginoon. Salamat, Panginoon, O Lord. Purihin po ang pangalan mo sa kataas-taasan. We give glory to your name, O Lord. We exalt your holy name on high, Father God. The great God, our Master, our Father in Heaven. We worship you, we adore you, O Lord. We give you praises and honor. And this we ask in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, Lord. A blessed Sunday morning, our dearest brothers and sisters. We greet you. A beautiful Lord's Day. And God is so good that He has given us another blessed time together this uh, Sunday morning to praise Him, to worship Him, to give Him all the glory and the honor as we continue to surrender our lives to the Lord and give Him our best praise and our best worship. Amen po. I hope and pray that uh, all of us who are tuned in right now are uh, in the best condition, uh, not just physically, but also spiritually. Uh, I hope and pray that we have prepared our hearts for this time of worship unto the Lord. So brethren, could you please join me in a short word of prayer before we hear the word of God. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace upon us this Sunday morning, Lord, to hear your word, O God, and to gather as your people, O Lord God. Father, we thank you for your grace that sustains us to be one, your grace that sustains us, O Lord God, to worship, O Lord God, together. Father God, even with these physical limitations, we know, Lord, that you are uniting us as one body. Maraming marami pong salamat. And Father, we continue to commit to you, Lord, the hearing of your word today. Father God, bless your word, O Lord, in ways that only you are able to do. Holy Spirit, we pray for your freedom to move in our hearts, to move in our midst, and to go before, O Lord God, before your servant. Go ahead of me, Lord, as I share your word. I pray for wisdom. I pray, Lord God, for your grace and enabling, O Lord God, to be able to, Lord, to preach your word, Lord, to impart your word to your people. Marami pong salamat, Panginoon. And we commit to you, Lord, all our brothers and sisters, all our viewers today, O Lord God, and those who will still be, be, be viewing this, Lord God, by and by. We pray, Father in heaven, for your mighty anointing, O Lord God, upon your service, Lord, upon this worship service, Father in heaven, this ministry. Marami pong salamat, Panginoon, and we pray that your name, Lord, will be truly exalted and glorified, Father God, as we hear your word. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, this is our prayer, amen and amen. This morning, brethren, we will be looking at another parable of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is called the parable of the wicked tenants, all right? The parable of the wicked tenants happens to be a parable that has been recorded three times in the gospel in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which makes it one of the most important parables of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It is a parable with special reference to the Jews 
And Jesus told this parable on Holy Tuesday during Passion Week. And I believe this is quite significant for us right now because of what uh, we read now in the news of about Israel and Palestine, about the war that is now uh, going on. All right, so... I'm sure we are abreast with the news that is uh, about the unrest that's happening there uh, in Israel right now. So, ano po kaya ang makikita po nating biblical worldview when we look at scripture so that we will have a better understanding of our times now. So, let's look at Matthew chapter 31 verses 33 to 46. Let's read the passage. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a, built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned the third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to the other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. Alam niyo po mga kapatid, there was once a story that happened in Guangdong, China about a man and a wife, a man and a wife whose bodies were discovered in their home. Apparently, their tenant who had rented a third floor room in their house had apparently stolen jewelry belonging to the couple and when confronted, stabbed them several times. Having bad tenants can produce headaches, but it can also be dangerous. So this is an, an example of having dangerous tenants that could, that even cause the death of this unfortunate couple. Brethren, we will find that the context of this parable is about the religious leaders, the chief priests and the elders of Israel questioning Jesus about the source of his authority. So makikita po ninyo yan dun po sa middle part nitong chapter 21 ng Matthew kung saan tinatanong po ng mga religious leaders si Jesus kung ano po ang basis, kung bakit niya po ginagawa ang lahat ng iyon. Ano po? Because as I remember right, the Lord Jesus cleansed the temple again for the second time and the chief priests, ano po, the elders were asking Jesus by what authority did he do these things? So, there were two parables that followed this incident. The parable of the two sons and the parable of the wicked tenants. Yun pong parable of the two sons, mainly ang sinasabi po roon, is that there were two sons who were given the task by their father to do something. The first son appeared to be pious, but in the end, he disobeyed his father. Now, the second son, who appeared to be one who is disobedient and rebellious to his father eventually was the one who obeyed his father's commands. Now, that is a picture of the religious leaders of Israel 
who appear to be pious, but in the end were actually disobedient because they did not believe Jesus Christ. But these, uh, the, the second son who represents the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the Gentiles, the sinners, they are the ones who appear to be disobedient, but in the end they are the ones who were able to enter the kingdom of heaven. They were able to enter the kingdom of God because... They were the ones who believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Amen po. So, yun po yung parable of the two sons. Now, after that, immediately after that, Jesus gives this parable of the wicked tenants. So, the Jews questioned Jesus' authority for doing the things he did. But here in this parable, it reveals that they are the ones who are guilty of assuming authority and ownership upon the nation of Israel when it did not at all belong to them because Israel belonged to God and Israel belonged to the Messiah who is Jesus. So this is the parable of the wicked tenants. No? So we will divide our message today, brethren, in two parts. The first part is the parable and its characters from verses 33 to 39. Under that, makikita po natin Ang tatlong bagay, the goodness of the landowner, the wickedness of the tenants, and the son of the landowner sent to the vineyard. The second part of the message this morning will deal with the lessons of the parable from verses 42 to 46, where we will find the rejected son is the rejected stone and the cornerstone, that is Jesus. And the second is God's grace to the church. All right? Now let's go to the first one. Let's look at the parable and its characters. The first part is about the goodness of the landowner, okay, in verse 33. It says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted the vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. The landowner, brethren, represents God. And the vineyard that he planted represents the nation of Israel. It says that the landowner put a wall around the vineyard, dug a wine press, and built a tower. All of those things have their corresponding uses. The wall was for security so that it will keep the animals and, yes, even the thieves, the robbers out. The watchtower is the place from which the vineyard could be observed and guarded. And the wine press was the place to collect the wine from the crushed grapes. In other words, this vineyard that was built by the landowner was a self-contained vineyard. It was a vineyard complete with fence, with wine press, with the watchtower. It was so well equipped so that one could expect a profitable return of investment. The same is true, brethren, with Israel. It was a nation that had been planted and was fully equipped to follow God. Hindi po kakaiba sa mga listeners po ng Panginoon nung pong panahon na yon, that Jesus was referring directly to Israel when he told this parable. Why? Because in the Old Testament, Israel was often symbolized by a vine. For example, in Isaiah chapter 5, it says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. So here, brethren, we will find that God loved Israel the way that the landowner la loved his vineyard and had taken pains to protect and to nurture the vineyard so that it will yield good crops. Let me read to you uh, something that J.C. Ryle wrote with regards to how Israel had been taken care of by God. He chose Israel to be a peculiar people to himself. He separated them from the other nations of the earth and bestowed on them countless blessings. He gave them revelations of himself while all the rest of the earth was in darkness. 
He gave them the law and the covenants and the oracles of God, while all the world beside was let alone. In short, God dealt with the Jews as a man deals with a piece of land which he fences out and cultivates, while all the fields around are left untilled and waste. The vineyard of the Lord was the house of Israel. So here we will find that the Lord allowed the nations to go on their own. But for a period of time, the Lord's focus, his program was focused. It was centralized on the nation of Israel. And brethren, that was for a purpose. It was for a reason. It was to prepare the Jewish race for the coming of Jesus Christ, who was going to be the Savior of the world. So now let's look at the second part of this parable, the second character, the wickedness of the tenants in verses 34 to 36. During the time of Jesus, hindi po uncommon to have landowners rent out their land to tenant farmers. Ang alam din po nating tawag rito is that these tenant farmers were called sharecroppers. The landowner provided everything, as we've said a while ago. The land, the plants, the wall for the protection of the vine, etc. All that the vine growers or the tenant farmers needed to do was to grow the plantation. And at harvest time, the tenants were expected to pay by giving the landowner his share of crops. Okay, But what did the tenants of the vineyard do in this parable? In Matthew 21, it says, When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned the third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first and they did the same thing to them. The tenants or the vine growers, who do they represent? They represent the religious leaders of Israel. That includes their kings, their chief priests, their scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the entire Sanhedrin. Like the vine growers, they didn't own the nation of Israel. All right, They were entrusted to care for the nation of Israel, but it didn't belong to them because Israel really belonged to God. They were entrusted to care for the spiritual life of the nation. Now, in the history of the Jewish nation, their leaders had often been corrupt, okay? Power-hungry and spiritually bankrupt. If we study even the period between uh, the coming of the Lord and the post-exile period, which is called the 400 years of silence, we will find that Israel and its leaders have really fallen into ano po, into corruption, especially itong mga leaders po nila. They have become so political, they have entered into corruption that even the position of a chief priest is something that they can bribe, ano po, that they can bribe, for example, their colonists or the the nations that have that have occupied them to grant them the positions of being religious leaders of Israel. So time and again, God would send prophets to call the people to repentance. But the prophets, just like these slaves that were sent by the master, they were attacked, they were persecuted, they were killed by Israel's leaders. We will find a few examples. In Jeremiah chapter 26, we will find that Jeremiah the prophet was one of those who were killed by the leaders of Israel. It says, The priests, the prophets, and all the people listened to Jeremiah as he spoke in front of the Lord's temple. But when Jeremiah had finished his message, saying everything the Lord had told him to say, the priests and prophets and all the people at the temple mobbed him. Kill him, they shouted. And tradition says that Jeremiah was stoned while he was in exile when he was in Egypt. Another example of a prophet can be found who was persecuted can be found in 2 Chronicles chapter 24 in verses 17 to 22. It says, Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. 
Why do you disobey the Lord's commands and keep yourselves from prospering? You have abandoned the Lord, and now He has abandoned you. Then the leaders plotted to kill Zechariah, and King Joash ordered that they stone him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. So these are a few examples, and there are other examples of prophets of the Lord who were calling the people of Israel to repentance, including its religious leaders. But its religious leaders were even the ones who killed these prophets. Ang isa pa pong example po nito ay si Isaiah, who was sawed into two, and according to tradition, he was sawed into half by the orders of King Manasseh. The Gospel of Mark emphasizes the repeated attempts of the landowner to reach out to the vine growers. So makikita po natin yung parable of the wicked tenant sa gospel account ni Mark kung saan makikita po natin na mas pronounced ano po, yung repeated attempts. Sabi po rito sa Mark chapter 12 verses 4 to 5. Again, he sent them another slave and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and that one they killed. And so with many others, beating some and killing others. What was the point? We know that in real life, an owner would not, would never do such a thing. Ano po? He would never do such a thing, meaning in real life, an owner would call in the police and put these wicked tenants to jail. Alright? So sa totoong buhay, Hindi po po pwedeng mangyari yung nangyari dito sa parable na ito kung saan pinatay na po yung pong mga servants ano po at at ilang ulit pa rin nagpadala yun pong landowner upang hingin yung kanyang produce ano po in real life ipapa ipapa dakip niya po ito pong mga wicked tenants po na ito no owner who had been so rudely treated would ever give a chance to such wicked tenants but this parable brethren is not about man, okay? This parable is about God's untiring patience, all right? God's untiring patience to get Israel to repent from their sins, to turn to God in faith, and to produce a spiritual fruit, all right? Now, the third, the third character in this parable is the son, the son of the landowner, who had been sent to the vineyard we find in which we will find in verses 37 to 39 it says in verse 37 but afterward he sent his son to them saying they will respect my son again this goes totally out of the normal if this story happened in real life in mark's account we will find that the story is even filled with great emotion it says in verse 6 of Mark 12, He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. Basahin ko po sa inyo ang sinabi po ni William Hendrickson patungkol po sa portion na ito. Sabi niya, The word finally is full of intense emotion and pathos. The owner has a son, a beloved son, his only child. Besides that son, there is no longer anyone else he can send. That son is his one and all. He is all there is left, the owner's last word. So he sent his son thinking, they will be ashamed of hurting my son. They will respect him. He spared not his own son. Brethren, this is the story of the love of God to Israel and to all of us. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son. Amen po. That whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. What happens is in verse 30. But when the vine growers saw the Son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill Him and seize His inheritance. In these verses, brethren, we can see that this parable is both historical and prophetic. Historical because we saw that time and time again, God sent His prophets to speak 
to the people of Israel to speak to their religious leaders to turn to God in repentance and leave their idolatry, leave their rebellion. That is in their past. That is historical. But this parable is also prophetic. Bakit po? It is prophetic because Jesus prophesies the murder that was going to be performed by these religious leaders who were plotting to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was prophesying what the murderers or the religious leaders are about to do. In verse 39, it says, the divine growers took the son, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, we all know, brethren, that Jesus Christ was taken out of Jerusalem and he was killed outside of the city. He was taken to Golgotha outside where Jesus was crucified. So this parable is prophetic of how the Lord Jesus Christ was put to death. Now, there is something here that we shouldn't miss, okay? The parable says, when the vine growers saw the sun, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. The wicked tenants saw the sun, okay? They saw the sun. They also called the sun the heir, all right? They also called the sun the heir, in other words, they recognized who this person was, that he was the son of the landowner. They recognized that he was the rightful owner of this vineyard. We will find very clearly stated, therefore, by Jesus in this parable, that the religious leaders were not ignorant about the claims of Jesus, that he was the promised Messiah. That the Jewish leaders knew that Jesus is who he claims to be. All right? That he is indeed the promised Messiah. Which means, hindi po sila confused or na, na misunderstand nila yung identity ni Lord. Hindi po sila puzzled. Okay? Hindi po sila ignorant or innocent. Brethren, the religious leaders knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Amen po? They knew that Jesus is the Son of God. They rejected Jesus not because he was counterfeit. All right? Alam nyo po, if you look at YouTube, you will find that there is this guy who would interview Israelis. And one of the questions ano po, that he asked these Israelis was, why do you not believe in Jesus as the Messiah? And... One of the answers of the Israelis was that because Jesus is counterfeit. Jesus is the false Messiah. And brethren, when you look at the religious leaders who killed the Lord, they did not kill the Lord because Jesus was counterfeit. They killed the Lord exactly because they knew that Jesus was the true Messiah. They killed Jesus because they knew exactly that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They had all the supernatural evidence by all the miraculous signs that Jesus had performed. But exactly what this parable of Jesus was saying is that the Jews will not submit to Christ because in their hearts, friends, they wanted the inheritance. They wanted the power to be able to rule Israel. They wanted the nation for themselves. Remember the response when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. It says, But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and then... The Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. They did not kill Jesus because he was the false Messiah. They believed that Jesus is the Messiah. But they didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus because they wanted the power to rule Israel. Because they wanted the vineyard or the inheritance for themselves. Brothers and sisters, here we will find that, that at the core 
of a person's rejection of Jesus Christ. It is not intellectual, but it is, it is rooted at the heart, at the heart of a person. And here we will find that a person's heart is depraved. A person's heart is utterly corrupt that apart from the grace of God, we will never really choose the Lord Jesus. Apart from the sovereign grace of the Lord, we will not really turn our hearts in repentance and believe in the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Lord. In Matthew chapter 21, it says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Bringing those wretches to a wretched end, the Greek word for the word destroy in other translations is the word apolumi. And in the NKJV translation, that word bringing them to a wretched end or the word destroy, it really means to destroy utterly but not to cause to cease to exist. Which means it is to be ruined so that one can no longer serve the use for which they were designed. Okay? So ano po ang naging prophecy ng ating pong Panginoong Jesus sa Israel when He said that they will be brought to a wretched end. I agree with some commentators that this is most likely the prophecy of the Lord about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Roman oppressors, where the city was destroyed as well as its temple. Since then, the temple has never been rebuilt again, all right? And the temple sacrifices have ceased and the priesthood have also ceased as well. The Jewish state ended not until the formation of the State of Israel in 1948. What are the lessons, brethren, of the parable of the wicked tenants? First, the lesson is that the rejected son is the rejected stone, and the rejected stone is the cornerstone. Jesus says in Matthew 21, verse 40, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus was the rejected son. Jesus was going to be killed by these religious leaders. And the rejected son is none other than the rejected stone that has become the cornerstone. Ang kinukote po ng ating Panginoong Jesus dito ay mula po sa Psalm 118. Psalm 118 verses 22 to 23 is a post-exilic psalm. And the Jews sang this psalm to recount how the Lord triumphed over the nations. Because as you remember, the Jews were taken captive and they were exiled in Babylon for 70 years. The nations rejected Israel. But as God's chosen nation, the Lord delivered Israel from their captivity and exile and returned them, and returned them back to their land. What Jesus does, therefore, is that he uses this same psalm to talk about himself, that he, like that rejected stone, is Israel's rejected Messiah, the Son of God, who is actually the cornerstone of Israel. So, Mga kapatid, ano po ba yung ibig sabihin ng cornerstone? No? We usually sing this in the lyrics of our songs that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. In ancient times, ang ginagamit po ng mga masons sa pagkoconstruct ng building are large stones ano po, which are used for construction. However, some of those stones were rejected and they were thrown away if the builders deemed that these stones were unfit for building. So here Jesus quotes scripture to say that the rejected stone actually becomes the cornerstone, the most important stone in the building. Now brethren, how do we find the chief cornerstone becoming now the foundation of the church of Jesus? 
In Ephesians chapter 2, it says in verses 19 to 21, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So brethren, ang sinasabi po ng Panginoon dito, that He was the rejected stone of Israel, but He is the cornerstone. Amen? He is the cornerstone who is the foundation of the church. He is the foundation of the kingdom of God. The Bible describes Jesus as the cornerstone that His church would be built upon. That Jesus is foundational. Once the cornerstone was set, it now became the basis for determining every measurement in the remaining construction, which means that everything was now aligned to it. As the cornerstone of the building of the church, Jesus is the standard of measure and alignment. Brethren, since the first century church, the apostles built on Jesus Christ as the foundation. And layer upon layer, churches, local churches, believers have been building on the Lord Jesus. And brethren, that includes you and me. Amen? That includes the believers today. That includes the Christians from various local churches who declare that Jesus Christ is the Savior the Messiah, and the chief cornerstone of their faith. And up to now, the temple is being built. And ano po ang foundation ng atin pong pananampalataya? The foundation, brethren, is Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is the foundation, everything will be in alignment. Amen po? It cannot be the building itself or the people itself. It cannot be the leaders of a church, no brethren, the foundation of the church is Jesus and Jesus alone. This is what happens when Jesus Christ also, brethren, is the cornerstone of our lives. Everything will fall into its proper place. Jesus will align every aspect of our lives according to His will. And there will be order and beauty in our lives. Amen po. Jesus will align all the aspects of our lives according to His will. And there will be order and beauty of, in our lives when Jesus is our chief cornerstone. In contrast, because the Jews rejected Christ, the Jews were left with nothing but a distorted religion called Judaism. They rejected Jesus, their very own Messiah, and as a result, they have been under God's judgment. They are now under a condition of unbelief and disobedience. And as uh, the book of Romans said, the Israelites right now or the Jews right now are under a season of hardening. Now, let's go to the second lesson. The second lesson talks about God's grace to the church. In Matthew 21, it says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. The wicked tenants, who are the religious leaders of Israel, tinanggal po sa kanila, yun pong right, alright, yun pong right, na sila po ay maging covenant nation po ng Panginoon. Because now we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a time which is called the church age. And the church age, according to Kenneth Quest, an evangelical Greek New Testament scholar, ang sinasabi po niya ay ito. Here we have the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem and the worldwide dispersion of the Jews in AD 70. Ano po? So, ito po yung pong prophecy ng Lord. Ano po? That the nation of Israel will be will will be taken away. Ano po? That the nation of Israel will that it will be destroyed. Okay? Although it will not be totally taken out of God's program, particularly in the last days. No, we do not believe that the church has replaced 
Israel. Rather, the church is now at a po point in time wherein the Lord is gathering to himself all the Gentiles who have been elected by the Lord into his kingdom. But there is still the purpose of God for Israel. There is still a time wherein Israel will be restored. So Kenneth Quest was saying that, that here we have the prophecy, not just of the destruction of Jerusalem, but also the call of the Gentiles and the church of Jesus Christ, the latter being the channel through which God is operating temporarily while Israel is in dispersion and until Israel will be regard, regathered at the second advent, at the second coming, and restored to fellowship with and usefulness to God. So, mga kapatid, meron pa rin pong purpose ng Panginoon for Israel because the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. We are now in the church age where the church is composed primarily of Gentiles. And the church, as we are now enjoying God's covenant blessings. But the church, as I have said again, as I have said a while ago, did not replace Israel. The Lord will still fulfill His promises to Israel when they finally acknowledge Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah and be saved. But what does Jesus mean when He said that God's kingdom will be taken away from Israel and given to a people who will produce its fruit? It talks about the church, all right, and her obedience to God. Unlike Israel that failed to perform its duty of being light to the Gentiles, the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has spread from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And it still continues to grow and spread far and wide. Again, this is all due to the gospel, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection which enables the church to be empowered by the Holy Spirit by faith. Now, God's grace to us who are part of God's church should be seriously considered for we have been granted the light of the gospel even though we are not looking for it. Correct? We have to seriously consider, brethren, our Calling. We have to seriously consider, are we producing fruit given these privileges that we now enjoy because once we were not the people, but now we have been called the people of God. Once we have not received mercy, but now we have received the mercy of God. As 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us, For we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the excellencies of God. Amen? That we have been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. So the question is, are we producing fruit? Are we walking worthy of the calling that we have received from God? The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. We have been shown the way we have been shown that it is not by our good works, but it is by faith in the finished work of Christ that we are saved. Our eyes have been opened. And while salvation is not by works, but fruitfulness is the evidence that we have been saved by grace through faith. So now the conclusion of the parable we will find in verse 44. It says, and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Judgment falls upon a person who rejects the stone who is Jesus. Rejection of Jesus Christ will merit the judgment of God. He will either be broken to pieces or he will be crushed and will be pulverized. This image of being pulverized is a picture of the chaff that is taken out of the wheat. And that chaff is pulverized or it is ground to dust. And this is what happens, brethren, to those who reject Jesus Christ. 
I'd like to close with a quotation from Spurgeon. Sabi niya, if you don't hear the well-beloved Son of God, you have refused your last hope. He is God's ultimatum. Nothing remains when Christ is refused. No one else can be sent. Heaven itself contains no further messenger. If Christ be rejected, hope is rejected. John chapter 3 verses 35 to 36 tells us, The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The message of the Lord this morning was once again an invitation for those of us who have not yet turned to Christ and believed in Him as the Savior of the world. Wala na po tayong kinakailangang intayin pa. We only have to turn to Christ now and put in Him the faith of our hearts and turn to Him the full surrender of our lives. Before we close in prayer, let us worship again the Lord. Let us sing a song unto the Lord. You hold.
close in prayer, brethren. Father God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, indeed, your mercies, O Lord God, are new every morning. Your steadfast love never ceases. And we thank you, Lord God, that in this parable of the wicked tenants, Lord, you have shown us once more how great your patience is. You have shown us once more, Lord, that it is your love O oh God, that leads us to repentance. And we pray that we may not take lightly your mercy and your love to us, O oh God. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you, Lord. Lord, for your wisdom is unsearchable. Your judgment, O oh Lord God, is beyond tracing out that even in the rejection of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, by Israel, it has brought forth, O oh Lord God, O Lord, life to the Gentiles, O Lord. It has brought forth, O Lord God, Lord, the spread of the gospel far and wide. And Lord, we are enjoying, O Lord God, the fruits, O Lord, of the gospel, the fruits, O Lord God, of what you have accomplished, Lord, in Calvary, the, what we have accomplished, Father God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross for our sins. Father in heaven, we continue, Lord, to be amazed with your grace. We continue to be amazed with your love. We continue, Lord God, to be amazed, O Lord, that we were not once a people, but now you have made us, Lord, a holy nation. You have included us, O Lord, into your spiritual family. You have called us, O Lord, out of darkness into your marvelous light. You have, O Lord, called us to be a chosen nation, a peculiar people, a people that belongs to you, O Lord. And Father, we pray, Lord God, that we may live worthy of our calling, that we may live to declare the praises, the excellence of him who has called us out of darkness. Father in heaven, we thank you, O Lord, for your gracious work in each one's life. Father God, alam po namin, Panginoon, that all of us are still, O Lord, a work in progress. That we are still under construction. That you are still perfecting, purifying, completing, Lord God, the work that you've started in our lives. But we have this assurance, Lord God, that because Jesus, O Lord, has died once and for all for the perfection of the saints, Father, we have this assurance and hope, O Lord God, that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete this work. We thank you, Lord Jesus, because you began this good work, and you, O Lord, will never begin a work that you will never, st- you will never, th- that you will never finish. We thank you, Lord, that our salvation is secure, that our salvation, O Lord God, is eternal. And even now, we can rejoice, O Lord, in the truth that we have eternal life because of Jesus, the Messiah, is the Lord and the Savior of our lives. And Father, it is our prayer, O Lord, that you will remove the blindness, O God, the veil in the eyes, O Lord God, of the Jews even today, that you will remove, O God, the blindness in their eyes, O Lord. That even in the crisis that they are going through right now, we pray that you will use them this. You will use 
this, O, Le o Lord God, for them, O Lord, to see, O God, that this judgment, O Lord God, that they're going through, O Lord, is because of their Lord disobedience. It is because they have not, they have refused and they have rejected to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And Lord, this is our prayer, Lord, that you will open their eyes and that they will turn to Christ by faith. Salamat po, Panginoon. At Panginoon, kung meron po kaming mga kapatiran o mga Lord, mga, mga viewers, sa oras po na ito, na nakikinig at nagsasabi Panginoon na nais po nila na kayo ay maging Lord, maging Panginoon at maging tagapagligtas ng kanilang mga buhay. Panginoon, kayo po ang siyang kumilos patuloy sa kanila. Father God, cause their hearts, O Lord God, to turn to Christ by faith and to believe in Jesus with all their hearts. Marami pong salamat, Panginoon. Father in heaven, we continue to pray for the furtherance of the gospel. We continue to pray, Lord God, for the spread of the word. And we continue to pray, Lord God, that as your church, Lord, we will produce the fruit, O God, that is expected of us, O Lord. Most especially, Lord, because we are no longer under the law, but we are now under the grace of God. We are now under the grace of Jesus and we are now serving in a new way through the Spirit of Jesus Christ in us. Salamat po, Panginoon. Father, we pray for your church. We pray, Father in heaven, that we will continue, Lord, to yield to you. We will continue to surrender ourselves to you, Lord. We pray that we will continue, O Lord God, Father in heaven, to walk in newness of life. And Lord, we pray that as the branch, O Lord God, that you have grafted into the vine, that you have grafted, O Lord God, into Jesus, we pray, Lord God, that we will bear fruits to the glory of God. We will bear fruits, Lord, that will reveal Christ in us. We will bear fruits, O Lord God, that will showcase, that will display the love and the grace of God upon our lives. Marami pong salamat, Panginoon. Father, we commit to you, Lord, all the households, all the homes, and all the families, O Lord God. We also commit to you, dear Lord God, Lord, our brethren, Lord, who are still recovering from COVID, Panginoon. Tinataas po namin sa inyo, Lord, sila Sister Nina, sila Brother Dalus, at ang kanila pong mga mahal sa buhay, Panginoon. We continue to pray for, Lord, your grace, and that your healing will be upon their physical bodies, and you will restore them once more to good health, including, Lord, your loved ones. Pinapanalangin namin sila sa inyo, and we pray for the salvation of their families. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will use this crisis, Lord, this health crisis, O Lord, for their loved ones, O God, to turn to Christ by faith. Salamat po, Panginoon. Lord, may you continue to reign in our homes. May you continue to reign in your church, O Lord God. Salamat po, Panginoon, for you have called us, O Lord God, into this holy purpose, into this holy calling that we do not deserve, O God. And we are indeed humbled by your grace. Father God, we also pray, Lord, for the Young Adults Fellowship this coming this afternoon. Tinataas po namin sa inyo, Lord, ang kanila pong blended fellowship. We commit to you, Lord God, all the all those who will be attending the in-person gathering. We pray for their safety. And we also commit to you those who will attend virtually. We pray, Father God, that Lord, that they too, Lord God, will be one in spirit, Father God, as they meet, O oh Lord God. Father, at the center this afternoon. Salamat po, Panginoon. We bless, we pray that you will bless, O Lord God, uh, the preaching of your word. We pray that you will bless, Lord, all our young adults and may their lives, O Lord God. Lord, continue to be the living stones that will continue, Lord, to, Lord, to be part of the temple that God is building, O Lord God, in the church. Salamat po, Panginoon. We are, Lord, committed to living our lives for your glory. We are committed, O God, to living our lives, Lord, for the praise of your name. And this we do only by grace, O Lord, according to the power that is at work within us. Salamat po, Panginoon. May you continue to bless, O Lord God, not just our church, but please continue to bless, Lord, your people all over the world. Father in heaven, continue to bless, O Lord, 
Lord, your the local churches that have gathered today, that are gathering, Lord, today, kayo po, Panginoon, ang maitaas sa inyo pong iglesia. Kayo pong maitaas sa kabuuan po, Panginoon, ng inyo pong church. Marami pong salamat, Lord. We pray for more souls to be saved. We pray, Lord God, for more, Lord, for more people, O Lord God, to turn to Christ by faith. Thank you, Father in heaven, for this wondrous work that you have done in our midst. We bless you, we worship you, and we are careful to give back to you all glory, praise, and honor in the most precious name of Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, we pray. Amen and amen. A blessed Sunday morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for joining us here at our Sunday online worship service. May you have a blessed time with your family and a fruitful week ahead of you, all by the grace of Jesus Christ. Salamat po and God bless.